Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Roger Eels. I run the uh, wireless selection here on behalf of Brooklyn's management. And I will take you through the history of the radios in here that were used on all the aircraft from about 1920 to 1985 when aircraft production stopped on this site. Come on in. Well, we have a small collection of radios. One of the things about the radios used here at Brooklyn's is the Vickers never really upgraded. I don't think they trusted transistors. So all the equipment you see here is valve radios. Only some of the very newer bits had actual transistors in, but still used valves for their main RF output. We have radios here going back from, as I say, about 1925 up to 1985. And we can really start with this one here, which is the 1132. And this radio, we only have the receiver of. The main receiver and transmitter you will find inside the fuselage of R for Robert, the Loch Ness Wellington that we have in the aircraft factory. And that includes the 1132 receiver and 1133 transmitter. Just moving on slightly to one side, we do have um, a board here which shows the beginnings of airborne radio in this country. Airborne radio in this country started in September 1911 with the first two-way transmissions using Morse code in 1912. From there on, of course, it's, um, the rest, as I say, is history. But we have an interesting picture of the operator and the pilot of the, of the monoplane, complete with steering wheel. Remember, these guys were car drivers before they became airplane pilots. Moving on about 10 years, we've got this 11, R, R1155. This is, with its matching receiver, T1154, 11, this was a whole different ball game. This is like a sea change in radios, because suddenly you have a radio you could tune, and you could see where your tuning was, and also had an intermediate frequency which could be amplified, thus giving you a much better audio output. The transmitter, again, with these transmitters and receivers, there was some aff attempt to link the two together so you could control the, the frequencies of the receiver or the transmitter from the other item, the other unit. Again, all valve technology. Uh, wonderful things about these in aeroplanes, uh, considering there was so much petrol and uh, so much uh, vapour about. Of course, you had a 1,200 volts DC on the anodes of the valves. This gave you about 100, 110 watts of RF at Morse code level. It also had a capability of voice using an amplitude modulated signal. This was mainly used for in-flight communications between this aircraft and other aircraft. So that was the, really the, 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 the two main ones. And you've got to remember, given the size, that Vickers probably purchased in the region of 10,000 of these radios. And they were used, as I said, had a long, long service life. It was used from 1939, and we know that Vickers was still installing them in Varsity aircraft in 1951 to 55. So that's that one there. The newest one we've got, and it's slightly out of sequence, and there's a good reason for that, is this one up here. It just looks like a black box. But this is an American Collins 618T radio. It's a transceiver. So it's a built-in transmitter and receiver. This still uses valve technology in the main RF output, but this uses ceramic valves rather than glass valves. This radio was used in all of the VC-10 aircraft purchased, or built here at Brooklands. This was also used in all of the Concords and some of the BAC-111s. The radio itself is in perfect working order. The unfortunate thing is it cannot be used in aircraft anymore because of the channel spacing. Channel spacing is 25 kilohertz on this and modern aircraft radio have to be 8.33 kilohertz. And there we go, that's that one. We have up, up on the top row, row here a series of test equipment. Most of this test equipment it was used during the test phases of everything from the Viscount, the Vanguard, 
VC10, BAC111, and a lot to do with Concorde. Although only Concorde, no Concorde ever flew out of here, it was used to test various items on the Concorde. One of the other interesting things we have is a black box. The black box is, of course, not black. It's bright orange. So orange is the new black. This one is a simple one. It's only a vo voice recorder, a cockpit voice recorder. The brass attachment on the front is commonly known as the pinger. This is a water-activated transmitter, very low power, <coughs> but it will put a ping out underwater to enable searchers to find, unfortunately, the wrecks of uh, an aircraft that might have gone down into the water. Modern day black box are much more sophisticated. Let's say this one's only a vo voice recorder. Modern ones, of course, will look at all functions on the aircraft, fuel, engines, uh, airframe, etc. The um, other bits and pieces we've got, where we got it, what, and I don't quite know how it ended up in our collection, we've got a hard landing indicator which was actually used on various aircraft to test the landing capabilities and forces subjected onto the undercarriage of aircraft when they were uh, being flown and test, and test flown in particular. Otherwise, we have for the children in particular, children love Morse code. They love hearing Morse code. So basically, we have a small setup here which we allow the kids to use, particularly if they've got one of the educational packs from the shop. And this gives us a chance to, or them a chance to practice Morse code. Etc. That's just a start, start signal with CQCQ. CQ. But um, kids absolutely love that. We have a small collection of books and people sometimes have a look at the books. We put it on a shelf there, really just to keep them out of the way rather than actually um, have do anything else with them. But uh, many people leave us a book, um, particularly to do with aircraft, airband radios and everything else. And we've got a lovely old news chronicle, Wireless Constructors by F.J. Cam, a very famous radio, radio designer of the 1960s and 50s. And again, going back round to the 1155, 1154 that we've got in the rack here. This is set up with two power supplies, so we can use this radio. The, the brownie color power supply is a <coughs> 240 volt in 1200 volt DC output, and that goes directly to the anodes on the valves in the transmitter. The lower unit, the black unit, is a 50 volt and 500 volt unit and this gives power to the receiver and shares power with the transmitter. This one can still be used although we have a little problem at the moment with the 1200 volt unit because we think it needs um, some um, internal maintenance which we'll do shortly. One thing we do have <coughs> up at the top here is a switch, a J switch. We call it a J switch. And this is the J-switch, and this is quite a rare beast. <coughs> it was used on all the aircraft, in, you know, Wellingtons, Halifax, Lancasters, etc., to select antennas. <coughs> but they are quite a rare beast these days. Right, one of the other things we do here at Brooklands, particularly within the wireless unit, is operate radio transmissions on various days throughout the year. We run a station for the International Museums on the Air, also the Marconi Day celebrations. And what we do for that is use one of the vehicles, one of the bigger vehicles outside in the aircraft park, or the last time we did it pre-COVID, on the start-finish straight, where we, run an we ran an antenna based on a British G5RV antenna between the staunchions on the end of the flight shed and a point about three quarters of the way up the test hill. From this, we could transmit pretty much around the world, given conditions. Um, we would log, on, log our station onto the various websites for Marconi Days or for Museums on the Air and get re a re response from them, which would also indicate the 
other stations that are on the air. So many stations that have a radio and wireless display like we do here, uh, we can chat, chat to them and chat about what they've got, what we've got. We also have contacts with other museums because sometimes with these old, old equipments you need to find bits and pieces to do restoration, maintenance, etc. So we have um, a good swap meet available online with other, other museums for various bits and pieces. That's what keeps us, allows us to keep these radios working. One of the other things um, we didn't mention earlier, but when we do restoration, we only tend to do internal restoration. We like to keep the radios working. We're not too worried about the external condition. Repainting, replastering the external condition, particularly say on this one here, it would, would be difficult because we don't want to lose all the printing we've got on here. We don't, it would be very difficult to replace that. So providing the internal part of the radio works, we tend to leave it like that. Valves interestingly enough, are the easy bit to replace. The hard bit to replace are things like displays, meters, controls, etc. These are the more difficult things to, to replace. This is why we keep in good contact with other museums, because sometimes they can help us, they have the right things, or we can help them out. Going back to the Marconi Day, Day Radio, we would use a transmitter or a transceiver and this would either be um, a Japanese ICOM or Yesu. We would sometimes use the American Elecraft equipment. We also have a linear amplifier, which will allow us to boost our signal from 50, 70 watts up to about a kilowatt. We also have radio uh, antenna tuners, which we can then use to tune the radios onto the antennas, or, or perhaps the other way around, tune the antenna onto the radio more likely, and, um, and, and then um, carry on uh, transmitting throughout the day. We have a small cadre of uh, members here, all volunteers, who are quite willing to come along and spend a few hours transmitting um, through the day. So we always manage to fill the days accordingly. Right, valve technology. One of the things I mentioned about the radios was they all use these glass valves, evacuated glass valves. The valve technology was the first ones used, and they date back, not these particular ones, but they date back to about 1903, when Lee De Forest de developed a diode valve, in other words, a rectifier valve, which could then be amplified by the use of a third input. One of the beauties of valves is, if you look at down the actual inside of the valve, usually from the top, you can see an orange glow. The orange glow is the heater. It's like a little electric fire inside. And this is, this is used to heat up the plates and causes the thermionic transmission of electrons to go between various plates. And depending on what is inside the valve, the valve can amplify, rectify, and do all sorts of other things. Many of these valves are designed for audio. Many are designed for RF. It would be quite... Um, it's difficult to sometimes tell without the manufacturer's diagrams or the manufacturer's uh, data, but the one I'm holding in my hand is basically a transmit valve. You tend to get those because you have a cap on the top, and this is the anode. This is the one where you have a very high voltage. Well, uh, anything up to 1,000, 2,000 volts will be on that cap. This one is more of an audio valve. This would be used in the audio sections of radios, so in receivers or in transmitters when you want to uh, increase the amplitude of the audio signal going in to drive the main transmit valves. Again, same thing again, you look for the orange glow. If you've got an orange glow in your valve, you can consider that the radio is halfway there. It's almost working. If you do not get an orange glow, the valve is dead and it's only fit for the bin. Smaller ones, they come in all shapes and sizes. This is a smaller one. This would be used in a transmitter uh, because of the, the way the, the, it's set up inside, I can tell. But again, this is the sort of thing you will find in all of the equipment here, apart from the Collins radio here, which uses a different technology for its valves. Again, I said ceramic valves as opposed to glass valves. This is typically the heart of a 
1154 transmitter. What you're seeing there on the right, right hand side are the, there's two transmitter valves, one behind the other. On the other side, there is uh, two smaller valves and these are the valves which um, amplify the, the audio coming in, the audio stream coming in for the transmitter valves. The technology is such, it, it looks a bit grubby, but we don't normally worry about that when we're trying to operate these radios. It's just that uh, we need to just keep your fingers out because there's a lot of voltage inside that unit when it's switched on. <clears throat> this radio would have been used in the years from about 1939 and we know it's up to 1955. Now interestingly, the unit we're looking at here, we believe was never used in an aircraft. We believe this one was used in a ground radio environment, i.e. in a control tower or possibly in a truck on an airfield. And we know that by looking at the receiver, because if you come down to look at the receiver, you'll see it's got a very finely serrated control here for fine and coarse. Now, on a flight rated receiver, and bearing in mind internally there's no difference between the flight rated ones and the ground radio versions, on the flight rated ones we have a very heavily notched control. And the reason being is in the aircraft, you've got to remember it's very cold in these aircraft, there's no heating, so you'd have thick gloves on, thick possibly thermal gloves, maybe even electrically heated gloves. And to get manual dexterity, on the receiver, that's why you had a notched control. Whereas on the other one, in the rack, it's, um, it's uh, just finely serrated, and that would have been used by ordinary hands in a, in, on a ground radio situation. So I say, the, um, the last ones we know that were in installed, that we know of, uh, was a 1951 to 1955 in the Varsity aircraft. Lots of radio amateurs still like to use this equipment and some people keep the, their equipment in absolutely mint condition. This one has obviously had a hard life, although it is still in full working order. Not bad for something that's coming up for 80 years old. I don't think your mobile phones will be working in 80 years time. The radio we have at the top here is slightly different from the other ones. This one was never designed to go in an aircraft. It's known as an R1132 or R1132A. This was designed to go into ships, either aircraft carriers or fast patrol boats, and it would have been a used for VHF communications, which was interesting because all the others is HF, and this was a VHF radio from 1941. Um, on Royal Navy cruisers, Vickers used them in their fast patrol boats. This is why it's in our collection. Again, all valve technology, and very, very luckily, the power supply we have here, the Type 234A, which was the power supply for this radio, we discovered this buried in our archive store only a couple of weeks ago. So now we've got it on. We powered it up very, very carefully because we do not know when it was last used. If it was last used in the 1940s, it survived remarkably well but we used a thing called a Variac, a variable voltage transformer, to wind the power up on the power supply very carefully so that the capacitors didn't go pop, or probably, given the size of the capacitors, I would say bang. And uh, we didn't want to let all the magic smoke out. This one works, so we're showing 250 volts, which is coming on the mains, so we can put it up to the mains voltage, which is about um, 300 volts, onto the re receiver itself. The receiver itself, all the valves are working. Interestingly, I did mention when we spoke about the valves, if you get a valve and it not, doesn't glow, you do, do not get an orange glow in it, it's because the heater's dead. And we had one of those va very valves inside this receiver. Fortunately, good old eBay allowed us to regain some new valves, some NOS, new old stock, and I think I brought two new valves for this radio, including postage and packing, for the grand sum of £7.75p. 
which wasn't bad at all because it got this radio back back into working order. It still needs another little bit of little bit of TLC to keep it, to get it going properly, but basically the radio itself is in a good condition. But as I say, not particularly one. To, it was never designed to go into an aircraft. This was, as you look on the, on the designed to sit in a 19-inch rack or a 19-inch cabinet. And again, that's uh, one of the things we don't have here. We don't really need it. The unit you're looking at here is basically a, an amplifier unit. During the test phase of the Vanguard and Viscount, the aircraft, the test aircraft, would have had transducers fitted to various points along the flying surfaces, in a rudder, elevator, aileron, flaps, etc., possibly undercarriage as well. The actual output of these transducers was never particularly strong, so to allow a voltage that could be used in a chart recorder. Most of the chart recorders were ink pen uh, long strips, sometimes on Smith charts. They used this amplifier. And this would increase the DC voltage from um, a few microvolts from the transducers to one, one, one volt peak to peak, something like that. Something that would be more usable for um, a chart recorder. We don't know if this unit still works because, of course, we haven't got any transducers to use with it. Gyro control unit, again, made by Sperry. This would have been used in um, uh, Vanguard, Viscount, um, possibly not the Valiant, but it, I, I don't really know the history of this particular unit, other than the fact that it would have been the, the gyroscope to control the uh, aircraft and keep it steady. Another transmitter, this one, this HF uh, Type 4 LRU made by Standard Radio. We know that there are some of these inside the uh, Vanguard. Again, I don't know much of the history of this one, but I suspect it did come out of Standard, uh, it did come out of a Vanguard. Going on for remote controller unit, again, so Viscount, oops, it's just slipped a little bit, stay there you, thank you. We have two units here. One of them is a remote controller, which um, allowed um, two VHF radios uh, to be controlled by the pilot stroke co-pilot -co uh, within a Vickers Viscount. So it's a reasonably, it's, it's re it had a reasonably long life. Here, I guess the, the, it probably still works, but again, we don't have the rest of the equipment to, to be able to, um, uh, to power it up. Wonderfully manufactured by a company called Gables Engineering Incorporated of Coral Gables, Florida, USA. The unit below is a, uh, a, a, an autopilot unit, again, from the era of the uh, Viscount. And this could be used to set Again, autopilot, George, often refer, it's often referred to as George, and that would be a, allow the pilots to take their hands off the controls and the aircraft will remain flying straight and level. We do fortunately have some spare power supplies and we do have a small workshop facility where we can at least um, pull radios apart and look at them and do maintenance and restoration. Just a slight aside, the, light with the, the radio with the light on is a receiver, not really part of the collection, but this is one I brought in. This is um, an R208, sometimes known as the satellite receiver, because it was one of the first type of receivers used for listening to the very first Russian Sputnik satellite sending beep beep beeps over the, uh, and around the world. This one still works, but um, I built the the loop antenna behind it so that we can actually use this. Instead of listening to Radio 2, we can listen to the, um, the Voice of Free China, Romania Online, etc. <laughs> All these other different stations you can find on HF. We have various other um, supplies. We have all the power supplies we need, plenty of sockets, and uh, most of this stuff has been provided by members over the years. We have a, a access to our antennas. Interestingly, we have two antennas outside. We have a, a large, a very tall vertical antenna. We also have a, 
and any amateurs would know, a G5RV antenna actually strung up inside the stratosphere chamber over and above and atop the stratosphere chamber itself. Other things we have, we have um, various, uh, we try and keep all the test equipment uh, uh, to match the era. So all the test equipment we've got basically, apart from multimeters, is valve technology. Well, thank you ladies and gentlemen for uh, following me through this quick talk on the wireless display. Uh, I hope it's whetted your appetite for coming to have a look. And uh, otherwise, we will see you at special events throughout the year here at Brooklands. Thank you very much.